Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we have the quarantine edition of As Told by Thielen book reviews. Today we have the French classic by Emile Zola called Nana. It's not Nana, it's Nana. This novel, Nana, is only one of a series or a cycle of 20 novels by Emile Zola. I do believe Nana was number nine. And Nana's backstory is revealed in some of these other novels. It's not Nana. And she's told to the reader to be rather neglected. She is attention starved. She has an alcoholic father and she's basically raised up from the Paris gutter. This is her backstory. We're not given a lot of that backstory here. But if you do read some of the other books in the cycle, you'll get a little bit more backstory and perhaps a little bit more sympathy for the character of Nana. But we're going to deal with what's in this book. Zola was experimenting or exploring what is known as naturalism in writing and that is explaining or showing humans through observation. So there's a lot. There is a glut of visual and ex descriptive detail in this novel. You will feel like you are watching a movie. It's very, very descriptive. The story begins on a Parisian stage at the Theatre de Variété, the Variety Theatre, if you want to make it, make it English. The play is called The Blonde Venus, and Nana is the new star. She's making her debut playing the main character. Two men who are cousins. You have Mr. Fautry, who's the drama critic, and then you have Hector de la Falois, Falois. They're watching this play. Nana, the actress, is called a, quote, light lady, which is uh, like a PC term for prostitute or sex worker. I don't mean to offend anybody, but we'll just call her sex worker. I like courtesan, personally. Let's call her courtesan. And Bordenave, who's the theater manager of the theater, the variety theater, he tells the cousins, just call, don't call it a theater, call it my brothel. So everybody, it's kind of comedic in the beginning. Like everybody's like, ah, call it my brothel. You know, all the, all the, all Paris is here to see Nana in the Blonde Venus. And this sets the stage for the novel, literally and figuratively calling it a brothel. The audience at the theater is, is a mixed world of society. You, I mean, perhaps like the readers of this book, you have a mixed world. You could have sex workers reading this. You could have people that had a really rough start in life. Could also be the same people that move up in society. But back in Parisian society, it was more classist. If you were a prince or a count, you usually stayed a prince or a count. And if you were a street walker, high chances you stayed a street walker. But sometimes you moved up and that was part of the courtesan lifestyle. The readers introduced to other characters right in the very first chapter. You've got Rose Mignon and her, her husband, who's we're told that she's a reg the regular star actress at the variety theater so there's already a little bit of tension between nana and rose because nana has taken the the title role in the blonde venus it, it we're also told that rose is comical and satirical as as an actress along with her husband who she's kind of being managed in a way by her husband and her husband in a way is sort of a pimp for lack of a better word he he's working on coupling his wife with this rich banker named Steiner. We'll call him Steiner. And so he's literally putting them together and they're all paddling around and it's like all good. It's, it's, this is a really interesting novel. At this point in the narrative, chapter one, Nana's fancy man, I guess you could say her sugar daddy, but he's called a fancy man, at that point is Dagonet. And the novel is like watching somebody dr juggle really fine porcelain china. And every, I wouldn't even say every chapter, every page is another plate. And you're just waiting for Na Nana to drop these delicate plates. Because for an extended period of time, she is just juggling this fine china as the chapters go on. And you're just waiting for the eventual end. And in a way, it's kind of a relief <laughs> that it finally falls apart. But let me not spoil it too much for you. You got Countess Muffat de Beville. That's the, the wife of Count Muffat. Um, she's known as Countess Sabine. A lot of these people that are counts and stuff have a, a billion um, titles, so we'll just keep it real simple. The count is uh, told to be very Christian and very, you know, upright and stuff. He's like one of the only upright people that are actually there at the theater that night, so he's the standout. You've got Lucy Stewart. 
she's not exactly told to be a courtesan. She might be. You got Satin, the streetwalker, obviously a courtesan. And then that's the the first night to big hit. And then we move on to the next scene where you're seeing Nana's apartment. It's being paid for by a rich Russian six months in advance. So now you're like, okay, she had this fancy man, Dagene, that you're told about. Then you're hearing about this rich, rich Russian that's already paid for six months in advance. But at the point in the story you get into it, she's already got bill players dunning her. And what happens is she's got her lady's maid is named Zoe, and she stays with her the whole novel, basically. So Zoe's on the scene. And Zoe's letting in all these different credit creditors, because that's what you did back in the day. When somebody rang, you let them in, and then they'd have their beef with you, and sometimes you let them sit in your parlor for hours. You know, they're your hairdresser or your baker or your dressmaker or your hat maker, whoever you didn't pay, you know. <laughs> so they sit away around waiting for their money. And so the lady's maid is letting in all these creditors, so you're, re you're realizing, oh, the Russian... Sugar Daddy, must it must have already fallen apart. So she lives in this kind of nice apartment that had been furnished and she probably already chewed her way through the Russians' money. So we're told that Nana has a child and the child is being raised by a nurse at this point in the story and she is endeavoring to get her aunt, Nana's aunt, Madame Lerat, to, to start raising the child. And in order to do so, she has to pay the the aunt 300 pounds so the aunt can get the pay the nurse off get the child and then get her own expenses paid which mind you at that time that was a lot of money and so in this novel you're going to find a lot of parasitic behavior from everybody it seems to be a parasite on somebody else most of the time it's on a bigger animal or creature or person sometimes it isn't sometimes people are parasite is parasitical towards the lower classes so it, it just very strange an interesting novel. Nana is shown trying to make the money for that day because she's got creditors in her all her rooms except for the bedroom stacked up by Zoe and so she's going out to go on dates in order to pay the money to get her son. So she's utilizing the services of Madame Tricon who is one of the city's top madams, um, who shows up from time to time whenever Nana or any of her other um, courtesans need some extra money and she'll like hook them up with somebody who's hard up for the day and then they'll get together, have their assignation, and then the people will go away with their money. The maid is letting in all these creditors into the flat, um, filling every single room, and Nana is shown taking the dates and paying the aunt and she's literally slipping out the window to go do a date, come back in to avoid all the creditors in the front rooms. And at one point she just gets utterly frustrated and kicks everybody out except for this one 17 year old boy, boy named George that had really been the first person to cheer her on the stage in the blonde Venus when she was making it a butt of herself and then before the people realized that it was comedy and campy. George was just overwhelmed with her beauty and um, she appreciated him and he was 17 years old and she takes pity on him and this whole entire novel she calls him a boy and a child and you know he's like just dying of love for her but then I realize they're only a year apart in age it makes a little more sense. So Nana is planning a big dinner fete, a big dinner party and she wants Count Muffat to attend it's not told to us why out of all these big pockets she chooses Count Muffat, the married Christian guy to go after to try to to try to be his main courtesan. Who knows why, but she wants him. She asks the journalist to, to um, Fouchery to secure the Count's invitation. See, the Count, he's cultured, he's upper crust. He refuses because he doesn't want to be seen in Nana's company. He's married after all. And you know, aristocratic classes ought to set a good example. That's one of the quotes. The dinner party was set for midnight, as you do, and to celebrate Nana's success as an actress in The Blonde Venus. Rose Mignon, she had been dating the banker Steiner through her husband. Remember, I told you he was kind of a pimp. And Steiner, once he saw Nana, he realizes he wants to start courting Nana. And in a way, that's fine with Rose Mignon's husband because I think he figures he'll just hook her up with somebody else but it wasn't it doesn't sit so hot and so well with Rose and so Rose decides to go after the critic there's a whole lot of switching beds switching teams switching sides in this thing so it's a whole lot of shuffling around with people and their partners so Count Muffat 
does not show up to N Nana's dinner and just that disappoints her and she gets a little bit ticked at Fauchery for not securing the invitation. But the Count does end up meeting Nana when he attends the Blonde Venus with a prince. So with someone higher than him, the prince wants to go to the Blonde Venus. Venus Count Muffa takes him where they go together and then the prince insists on it on an interview with her, insists on seeing her, you know, meeting her af backstage. And the Count sees Nana nude and that just blows his mind he is she's dressing as venus or undressing however you want to look at it and he becomes charmed and obsessed as her with her as an adolescent he is absolutely gacked out of his mind about her body her aura the smells in the dressing room and he becomes inflamed with lust and he kisses nana Nana on the back of her neck after the show, which is just like, you got to understand, this is a married Christian man that just is so upright and he's just so overcome with his <laughs> loins that he's over the moon. And Nana tells him to visit her in her country house and he promises to accept her invitation. Meanwhile, the Count goes to dinner with his wife and his daughter to the Fondette's home. Now, Madame Hugon, now you might be going, all oh, these people, you're killing me. Madame Hugon is the mother of the Georges fellow, the fellow, the little 17-year-old that, um, that threw out the praise for Nana and that Nana didn't kick out of the house when he came to give her a bouquet. They're always at these fondettes, and they're there, and Fauchery's there, that's the critic, and Dagonet, her first fancy man's there, and they're all gossiping as even... The higher classes do and the count come off that hears that steiner the banker has bought nana a country estate so you gotta think nana's got an apartment paid for by a russian it's now he he's gone the money is now owing on the apartment because six months have come and gone and so steiner the rich banker is enthralled with her and has bought her a country estate so what happens is all the men in the room that are interested in her at this dinner start in their minds making plans. The Count's want, wanting to get out there to this country estate and maybe try to have a rendezvous with her. And George, the 17-year-old, he can't wait to get out there and try to have, have relations with Nana. And so George, little George, 17-year-old George, he fakes a headache, okay? Because he's, back in the day, people used to go to people's houses and stay for like a week, okay? They'd go to somebody's houses at a dinner party, but the dinner party would last a week. And so, George, he fakes a headache and he takes to his bed in order to slip out and run, run to Nana's country home. So, Nana, she has led the Count along, but she hadn't sub succumb to Count Muffat yet. See, that's part of the thing. You kind of make promises and you just kind of drag them along and, and they're not going to take you by force. They have wives. You know what I mean? They're not going to do anything to upset the apple cart at this point. So she's playing with Count Muffat for, ten, for three months. Now, mind you, she's got Steiner. She's currently balancing as a plate. So she's got a hot plate of Steiner. Now she's got Muffat. She's trying to keep him busy and then she's got George coming in that it's not giving her anything but a lot of attention and she treats him like a well, my baby my son you know she just kind of babies him all this is going on at the country house and George gets very jealous of the thought that Muffat is coming on the scene now he already knows Steiner's on the scene it's funny because people accept things like I accept that she's with Steiner but she doesn't really love him but this Muff, Muffat, uh, uh, uh so he runs out there and he jealously cries to Nana at her country home about her upcoming rendezvous with Muffat and Nana tells George, okay, this, she's so crazy, she tells George that Steiner's there. You gotta leave, Steiner's here, okay? And then when the Count shows up, she tells the Count that Steiner's there. And so she tells Steiner that she's ill. So she gets everybody, it's so funny. It's like, I don't want to be with you because of this. And I want to be with you because of this. And oh, and now I'm ill. So what she ends up doing, she ends up being increasingly unkind to both the Count and Steiner. But then she ends up slipping off and having relations with the 17 year old. The person that can do her no favors whatsoever. Is she in love with him? No, she's just 
young and impetuous and she and I don't I don't think she has oppositional defiant disorder but she does not like to be told what to do either so you got that factoring in there Nana is being literally bathed in money bathed in riches being bought random houses and things from these men and she mentions like she gets frustrated she's almost like the kid at Christmas morning that's more excited about the presents and then once she opens them they only have they they have a really short shelf life before she's on to the next dream in her mind. She mentions a thousand francs that Steiner owes and the count was you know she tells him he he's such a dolt that he never paid her the proper amount for a courtesan but see because the count had never had a courtesan before. He was real Christian and before he even goes to bed with her he prays and then he has sex with her and he prays again. <laughs> kind of a joke. Na na in order to get rid of them because once she gets kind of the point where she soaked them a little bit maybe she hasn't drained them dry but she soaked them and she starts getting bored with them especially if they're kind of ugly. Um, she tells the count that he's a cuckold <laughs> and that his own wife Countess Sabine is having her own affair. Now you got to imagine what this is going to do to a guy because a lot of men think it's fine and, fine and dandy for them to have affairs. It's not a fine for a woman to have an affair on them. So he goes off to spy on his wife and stands out in the side in the rain for hours and he almost kills himself. He physically wears himself down and walks all around the cities of Paris and then comes back and cries in Nana's lap and then they argue. And so what she does is she literally shows the count that she has Fontaine, yet another man in her bed in Paris, okay? This Fontaine fellow is just some actor from the, the Variety Theater, and he's not even cute. So this is what kills you. It's like Nana, like you, okay, you're gonna be a courtesan, be smart courtesan. Keep it moving, keep it professional. Don't embarrass people, get the, get the money you can out of them. You know what I mean? But don't be stupid, but she's real childish, essentially, with the way she she operates. He's just another actor from this theater, this Fontaine. And when Nana gets bitchy with him, because she tends to get bitchy with all her men, she's only sweet to the point where she gets what she wants. And then, and, and then she'll be bitchy and then you come and give her sapphires or diamonds. She'll be sweet for a little while. That kind of thing. When she gets bitchy to Fontaine, he decks her. He hauls off and hits her. And you know what? He and Nana move in together and she kind of tries to be like the normal housewife and at that point she's not a courtesan. She's, she leaves that behind her for a little while and he ends up beating her for everything and she grows accustomed to it. It is the weirdest thing in the novel. She is a very uh, forced not to be reckoned with through the whole beginning of the novel and then she starts getting beat and it's almost like she feels like she deserves it and then in a weird way it's some Stockholm Syndrome thing. It's like she likes it. It's weird, okay? It is weird. Between these beatings, she sees Satin, the old street, well, not old, Satin's younger than her. She sees Satin, the streetwalker, um, at the market. And Nana, just to let you know how she's fallen, like here she had golden goblets, you know, for a while. And now she's back buying stale pigeons at this market that's mostly frequented by sex workers. And so she sees Satin. And she confides in Satin that she's being, that she loves Fontaine. Oh, Fontaine from the theater. Yeah. You know, I'm not with Count anymore. I kicked him out on his butt. And like, she makes this big lie about how she kicked the Count out. Like, kicked his butt with her, with her shoe, you know. And she fibs and she renews the friendship with Satin. And her and Satin, they sit for hours at Satin's really decrepit um, one room. And they talk about Fontan and his abuse. And they sit around drinking absinthe, you know. And that that's a whole entire scene. You just imagine those Parisian pictures of the women drinking the absinthe. And, and, and yeah, that it's, it's very evocative of a lot of old French paintings as well. So eventually Nana begins to street walk because to pay for her lifestyle with Fontan because he becomes cheap and wants to split everything half and then doesn't pay his half. So the Madame Tricon, Tricon or Tricon, she comes back on the scene to help Nana find dates in the when she is in a pinch to pay for things. Um Fontan, kinda like Nana, when he finds that her obsession with him and her interest in everything with every little thing he's doing and he starts taking advantage of her, even as he's beating her, because she's just not challenging him at all. She gets on his nerves because she doesn't 
she does every single thing he wants. And so he locks her out. And in, in a scene, it is just so strange. He locks her out. And when she's banging on the door, because mind you, that's all she's got is in that little tiny room. And all the money that from all these houses and little properties, these little landed properties she had for a short time, everything was liquidated to like 10,000 francs or something. And he had taken over that money and said, oh, let's pull our money. So all the money that was in that little apartment and he just locked her out. And as she's pounding on the door, the only thing he says to the door is merda, which is like, I think it's Spanish for shit. And he just keeps saying it over and over and over. And she's just down outside hysterical and he's just like merda, merda. And he just like blows her off. So she has nowhere to go. She goes to stay with Satin, the streetwalker, and Nana finds real comfort in Satin, who tries to seduce her. Yeah, so Satin tries to seduce her, and the bedroom gets raided by the police, and Satin had been arrested before as a streetwalker, and so she had no interest in getting arrested again, and Nana escapes through a window and ends up going back to her aunt. Lerat, the one that was taking care of Louis Set or Louis, her son. So, and I believe Satin might have gotten arrested at this point. So that ends that burgeoning relationship there. Fully down on her luck at this point in the story, Nana goes back to the Variety Theater to see about a part. And she um, hears about there's this part of the respectable woman. She was offered some really small part and she hears that there's the main part is of the respectable woman and she feels like she can be respectable. You know, she doesn't have to be a streetwalker. She doesn't have to play Venuses and courtesans. She can play a respectable woman. So she wants this part. And the Count sees her. And the Count, meanwhile, has been seeing Rose Mignon. See, because the seal's broken. He's already broken his marriage vows. You know, he's already had a courtesan and now he's going to have another one. Well, he was with Rose Mignon. Nana appears on the scene and twinkle, 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 the Count wants Nana again. Can you, now, you know, imagine how Rose feels now, right? So the Count buckles and he offers Nana everything, like everything. I'll give you everything if you'll be mine alone. So come to me, be my courtesan. Don't be with any other man and I will give you everything you want. And she declines the Count. But She's, she's just manipulating him because she tells the Count that she wants that respectable woman part. And he's like, well, I have nothing to do with the theater. I don't, I'm not the writer. I'm not the owner. I, I don't have any, you know, way of doing this. And she's like, I, you know, basically you figure it out. Nana totally upsets the dynamics in the theater by bargaining with the Count. And he gets the leading role for her as the honest woman by just using his money. It, this upsets Ro Rose Mignon on two points, not only as the prime, not only for the prime role, uh, but also as the court's, the Count's current lover. And the Count ends up buying Rose and the Mignons as a couple out of her fees and out of her salary, and then some. And Nana become, becomes Rose's real rival, as you can probably imagine. And at the Count's expense, Nana goes ham if you thought that he was supporting her before which again she had called and said oh you know you're not really even paying what a courtesan's really worth she wasn't soaking him before now she sets to soak in him and everybody every other man or person with a pocket she's going to soak them so at the count's expense nana sets up herself in a luxurious apartment with all the tra trappings and the way that the novel talks about how she eats through money and people, it is just, it is stunning. It is stunning. I, I can't even really think of something in modern society of how they would chew through money and the way she chews through money and, and all the parasites that also come to take the leavings. But see, Nana, she doesn't change at all being the Count's only one. On the sly, Nana takes up with Count Xavier de Van Duver. Um, just for even for more money and, and probably, probably for the thrill. She's got, she's got some thrill in her. So Nana runs into Satin and takes her in like a stray kitten. Poor little Satin is out about. Satin had taken her in. So now she takes Satin in. And so you've got M Count Muffat. You've got Van Duver. That's another Count. you got George, the 17 year old. you got now George's brother who had come to on Mama's part to get George away from Nana, 
Philippe, and then he ends up under Nana's spell. I mean, it is literally insane. And Satin. They all become Nana's lovers pretty much at the exact same time. And it is really insanity how they all kind of half pretend it's not happening and then accept certain people. And it's just, it's all kinds of insane. So Nana becomes obsessed with Satin for whatever reason. And Satin keeps slinking back off to her old haunts from time to time. It's almost like she finds Nana's obsession too much as well. Once Nana focuses on you and really likes you, it's too much. And so Satin from time to time will like kind of sk skitter back to her old haunts and then Nana will come and grab her and drag her back to the fancy part of town and and then flaunt her relationship with Satin in front of the men, like even at dinner, around dinner with all these lovers and she's, you know, lying to them all or some of them know that she's with one but not the other and, and she's sitting here kissing Satin at the table in front of all these men who are dying of love for her. And back then, <laughs> bisexuality wasn't accepted. So if you want to give Zola another credit, he went there and he went there hard. Now granted, did he, did he give explicit details about the sexual acts? No, he did not. But, I mean, yeah, it's here. It's here in this novel. And, you know, kudos for bringing up a topic that wasn't, you know, commonly discussed. Especially not in old, you know, 19th century literature. Come on. In order to get even with Nana, Lucy Stewart and Mignon, Lucy Stewart has this letter of the Countess Moffat. Remember when Nana had told the Count way back at their first fight, Oh, you're a cuckold. Your wife's cheating. Well, there's apparently was a real letter of Countess Sabine, the wife of Count Muffat, sending love notes off. I think it was to Foutry at that time because they all are hopping around beds. And so they, she has this, this letter and she's going to drop it. And it's going to just humiliate the Count, ruin the Count, ruin his finances. And you know what that means? That ruins Nana. Really doesn't. But, you know, that's the thinking. So she's going to drop this letter in to the Count to disabuse him of his wife's fidelity and it's going to ruin the Count, it, Nana's main sponsor, but in a counter move, because Nana, Nana is not stupid, she tells the Count to go back to his wife at least part time. So it takes the sting out of what gets out because, oh, they're back together. I mean, they seem happy. They're playing happy families. So, but she has to uh, basically tell him, oh, you can come back around, but, you know, go go back to your wife and, and fix this. And also, she gets bored to death of these men. Bored to tears of these men. So, Nana becomes juggling. I was talking about that juggling, the fine, fine, the fine china that are these relationships. They get bigger and bigger. They get more and more delicate. And she's just juggling and juggling and juggling. And you're waiting for the plates to fall. And when one falls, they usually all fall and they're broken. She begins juggling these larger relationships and the reader is always tense and in anticipation of a, a crash, a death, a jealous rage, a stabbed breast with scissors, bankrupt men, men who burn themselves alive in a stable with their horses. This all happens. Yes, I said it. So if you want to know the deets of that, read the book. I want you to read Nana. I do. George's brother, Philippe. That was one that George didn't want to believe that she was having relations with his brother. You know, they all have their little ton of vision. I know she's having relationships with Steiner, but I don't think she's having a relation with my brother. She said she didn't. So he finds out that Philippe, the brother who is older, began stealing from his own regiment to give money to Nana because he ran out of money. And so she kept asking everybody for money. And so he starts stealing from his own regiment and he gets locked up. And George realizes that Nana is actually having sex. Actually having sex. Not just flirting. Having sex with his brother. And so Nana admits it. She throws it right in his face. It's like, yeah, so what? I'm doing it with Philippe. So what? What you going to do about it, little boy? You know, what you going to do about it? So George begs Nana. He's like, please marry me. Please marry me. And, and he's just desperate. He's a 17-year-old kid. He's desperate. And she blows him off. She just blows him off. And so he takes scissors and stabs himself in the breast. And he, 
He's taken away the the blood drips on this carpet, and it's almost a symbol because every time they enter her room, they, the men have to step over this blood, and they all kind of know it was his blood. And it's, he ends up dying later on, and they're not even sure if he d died from the wound. But he's taken away by Mama, tried to be nursed to health. But, you know, there's just one fatality after another that ends up occurring. One quote that I found rather poignant to talk about all these ruined men, it's, A ruined man fell from her hands like a ripe fruit to rot on the ground by himself. <laughs> True. Nana becomes abusive to Count Muffat. I mean, really abusive. Treating him like a bad dog, hitting him. The Count! She's hitting the Count. Turns out that he loves being abased by her. He gets into it. I mean, she treats him like a dog. She tells him to bark on a dog and to walk on all fours. Now, granted, not in front of other people, but I mean, but his breaking point, she always got to wonder, what's the breaking point for each of these individuals? His breaking point is when he finds his ancient, slobbering, I don't know if he's demented or if he has Alzheimer's, but his father-in-law, that means Sabine's father, Countess Sabine, his ancient father-in-law, he finds him in bed with Nana. I mean, the guy's just like, ah, you know? And that is the Count's breaking point with Nana. Time goes on and Nana ends up dying from smallpox, a contagious disease that wreaks havoc on one's body. And we see the point of view of the ending of Nana from pretty much from the courtesans, more than even the men, the suitors. Her outer beauty in this book is utterly destroyed. I mean, we are given such descriptive language about her beauty and it is utterly destroyed by the po smallpox. And one could argue that the inner ugliness of Nana has seeped out. I don't know if I would go that far. There's all kinds of symbolism to be had in this book. Of, but, you know, Nana is a symbol of the society at that time. And yada, yada, yada. Um, let me find the part that describes what Nana looked like at the end as um, seen through the eyes of one of the courtesans. And I do believe it was Rose Mignon who went to make up with Nana, hearing that Nana was dying of smallpox. And another thing I want to add is a lot of the people that went to see her when she was on her last legs were the courtesans or, or, the, or, or the people at the, um, the actors. It wasn't the, the men. They were still um, rather cowardly. So I'm going to read you a passage from the book that explains what Nana looked like at the end as the, seen through the eyes of Rose Mignon. Oh, she's changed. She's changed, murmured Rose Mignon, who was the last to remain. She went away. She shut the door. Nana was left alone with an upturned face in the light, of the, in the light cast by the candle. She was fruit of the charnel house, a heap of matter and blood, a shovel full of corrupted flesh thrown down on the pillow. The pustules had invaded the whole face so that each touched its neighbor. Fading and sunken, they had assumed the grayish hue of mud, and on that formless pulp where the features had ceased to be traceable, they only resembled some decaying damp from the grave. One eye, the left eye, had completely foundered among the bubbling purulence, and the other, which remained half open, looked like a deep, black, ruinous hole. The nose was still separating. Quite a reddish crust was peeling from one of the cheeks and invading the mouth, which it distorted into a horrible grin. Over this loathsome and grotesque mask of death, the hair, the beautiful hair, still blazed like sunlight and flowed downwards in rippling gold. Venus was rotting. It seemed as though the poison she had assimilated in the gutters and on the carry-on tolerated by the roadside, the leaven with which she had poisoned the whole people, had but now remounted to her face and turned it into corruption. And that was like one of the last sentences in the book. Just destroyed. Just destroyed. Some of the best writing here found in the Na, in my opinion, was the writing in the scenes where Nana goes to the country house that Steiner has purchased for her way back when and how 
blown out she is about it and it just reminds her of everything she dreamed of when she was a child in the gutter and she was you know lady of the manor for a short time and she was enjoying all the all the country life and it just is just charming charming writing it's almost as if you're watching through the eyes of a child seeing the country and the dirt and the the vegetables and the animals for the first time. It's it's lovely writing. Another a part that I found was, um, I was taken aback by it, but I was refreshed by the fact that he would go there was Na Nana's obsession with satin and the bisexual relationships that were being written about were very rare at the time, and and that that was other that was more good writing from Z Zola. One thing I found very tiresome, which some people just loved, was the horse races. There's some um, horse racing <laughs> that goes on in some bedding, and it's a whole chapter, but it just, it was tiresome to me. It just bored me to tears, but that's just my opinion. But other than that, I highly recommend Nana to you guys. Nana. Yes, Emile Zola. Yeah, just did a good job with this one. I think one of his the most famous work he did other than Jacques was Germinal and you might have had Germinal um, assigned to you. I know I did because I have it on my shelf so I know that it was assigned to me somewhere <laughs> somehow. So so I hope you enjoyed the classic book review of Nana by Emile Zola and if you did I would appreciate it if you push that like button and hit the subscribe bell. Basically what that does is it just lets you know next time I upload a video, I upload about once every three weeks. It's not, and it's not, a, it's not on schedule. It's pretty much as I read something or as something comes to me, I do classic book reviews, which take more time. I do true crime, which could also take a lot of time. I, I've done a couple COVID videos. Those, those, those don't take me a lot of time because usually I've read the scientific article in like a day or two. And I also do conspiracy fact videos, which I... Those don't take me long because I already wrote the book on some of those. So anyway, if you're interested in any of those topics, it'll say that in the video. You can choose to watch the ones you want. Not if you don't want to watch one, you just pass it by. And thank you so much for your, your subscriptions and for your comments. And I hope you have an excellent day. Take care. Bye.